Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. Today, we return to our sub-series on Polish reportage, or creative nonfiction, which I've been calling the most productive genre in contemporary Polish literature. Back in season one, episode 10 of Encounters with Polish Literature, I spoke in my introduction about how the Polish school of reportage, as we know it, began with Ryszard Kapuściński, who applied the techniques of the novel to journalism, particularly the idea of realism or little realism, adapted from the fiction of writers in the 1960s, like Marek Nowakowski, to tell a big story about the workings of power in society or government through the perspective of a seemingly minor character or incident. We also noted that Kapuściński did not appear in a vacuum. The 19th and early 20th century realists, such as Sienkiewicz, Proust, and Raymond, published fiction serially in newspapers and periodicals, where time unfolded in their fictional works in the same way as it did in the adjacent news articles. And they published literature of fact themselves. Sofia Naukowska relied on interviews and real events in the production of her characters and storylines, and her late work, Medallions, is the product of interviews with Holocaust survivors. On either side of World War II, the major figure in Polish journalism was Melchior Wańkowicz, known for what he called his mosaic method, much akin to montage in the cinema and likely influenced by Russian writers like Valentin Katayev, whom he published in Polish translation in his publishing house, Rui. And then Professor Beth Holmgren from Duke University and I looked at two contemporary works by women journalists in the tradition of Polish reportage. Małgorzata Szenert's Ellis Island about the immigrant experience in New York, translated by today's guest, Sean Gasper Bai, and Magdalena Grzebałkowska's 1945 War and Peace, translated by John and Małgorzata Markov, about the mass displacements of population in Poland in the wake of World War II. For more details, go back to the Polish Cultural Institute New York website or the playlist of all of our previous episodes in the description below and navigate to Season 1, Episode 10 of Encounters. In part two of our series on reportage, season two, episode one, Beth Holmgren and I look at two pieces of nuclear history through the eyes of two Polish journalists, Philip Springer, who writes of a uranium mining town that is abandoned and slowly sinks into the ground after its ore is extracted for use in the Soviet nuclear arsenal in the 1950s. Springer's work is called History of a Disappearance, also translated by today's guest. Katarzyna Boni in Ganbare, Workshops on Dying, translated by Mark Ordon, looks at the Fukushima disaster of 2011 and its short and long-term effects. And she gives us a sense of how these events can resonate in the minds of Polish observers with their own histories of disaster, trauma, and loss. And she considers how some of the memorial practices from Fukushima, such as the eponymous workshops on dying or Itaru Sasaki's wind telephone have made their way to Poland and around the world. Today, I'd like to think about some aspects of the contemporary Jewish scene in Poland as described in Mikolai Grinberg's I'd Like to Say Sorry, But There's No One to Say Sorry To, also translated by today's guest. And an untranslated work, we're getting there now to untranslated works, uh, called Skarby or Treasures by Patrycja Dołowy. I think the immediate association that Dołowy intends to invoke with that title and its context is the myth that many Jews buried their valuables before being deported by the Germans to concentration camps, and that there is Jewish gold to be found in Polish soil if one one only has a treasure map and a metal detector. But she reveals that there are many more treasures to be found, sometimes in the form of matzevot or Jewish tombstones that have been repurposed for other purposes or simply neglected in cemeteries in towns where no Jews remain to take care of them. Jewish property that was left behind with neighbors before the owners were murdered, lost photographs sought by descendants of Holocaust victims, and simply memories that may remain in the minds of the oldest inhabitants of towns that once had large Jewish populations. 
Before we meet today's guest, I'd like to thank everyone who has been following and supporting Encounters with Polish Literature and remind you to click the thumbs up, ring the bell, subscribe, and leave a comment. I was just noticing that the Polish Cultural Institute New York's website, uh, YouTube channel rather, almost has 1,000 subscribers. Small by YouTube influencer standards, I know, but when this program started, the channel had 80 subscribers in its third year of existence, and three years later, it has grown more than 10 times. Of course, Encounters isn't the only content on the channel, but our audience has given us more views than any of the other programs here. And we are very grateful to you for your loyalty and engagement. So if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to push us over 1,000 subscribers. I bet we'll get there by next episode. Sean Gasper Bai has translated books by authors including Małgorzata Schoenert, Stepan Twardoch, Mikołaj Grinberg, and others. His translations have won the ERBD Literary Prize and the Asymptote Close Approximations Prize and have been shortlisted for the Work Prize for Women in Translation, the National Jewish Book Award, the Sammy Rohr Prize, and the National Translation Award. He has been a National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellow and Translator in Residence at Princeton University. He serves on the board of the American Literary Translators Association, one of our publicity partners, and mentors emer emerging translators through the National Center for Writing and the Yiddish Book Center. He lives in Philadelphia. Sean, we have been discussing your translations on other episodes of Encounters with Polish Literature, and it's great to finally have you here on the program. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's start by, you know, I, I know we've we've talked about um, what reportage, Polish reportage is uh, with uh, Beth Holmgren on the previous uh, episodes uh, relating to reportage, but everybody has their own uh, take on it. Uh, what's yours? Polish reportage uh, is a completely um, kind of specific tradition of, of nonfiction storytelling. It's something that arose specifically in Poland, as far as I can tell, I think influenced by other traditions, but um, not not shared with other languages in the region, with other countries in the region. Um, the, the fundamental characteristic is that it's a way of telling nonfiction stories using the conventions of fiction storytelling, you know, using sort of uh, those same ways of structuring a story, for instance, or, um, you know, of presenting character development or something like that. Um, but there are a couple of characteristics of Polish reportage that are that are specific and that create a very particular style. Um, the, this is sometimes um, called, I think Kapuściński might have called it this little realism, um, a tendency to focus on individual characters and their individual lives as a sort of synecdoche for a broader theme. So that rather than talking about the subject in general terms and rather than doing kind of higher level analysis, you look at a person who represents that theme and you do very little actual analysis. You just sort of let them represent themselves. Um, my understanding is that this grew out, this grew up as a way of, um, of coping with censorship under communism, right? Because if you were talking about subjects that were challenging uh, to the regime, for instance, um, focusing in on an individual person and their and their personal life and then not doing any kind of analysis about it gave you a level of i think um plausible deniability <laughs> you could say oh well i'm not you know i'm not criticizing how you know the factories don't work the way that they're supposed to i'm just saying that this was this one's worker work, this one worker's experience you know this is the one thing that happened to this one man and um uh, and that I think that style persisted beyond the end of communism because it's actually just a very compelling way of telling a story. Um, I think another characteristic is a very stripped back literary style. Um, again, I think this is partly so that the author doesn't insert themselves too much for the reasons I just explained. Um, but I think it's also I think it's also a conscious choice on a part of a lot of writers. I'm thinking of something that, um, I heard Hanna Kral say once that basically the more challenging or, you know, sort of harrowing the material, the more understated you want the prose to be. Um, because you don't need to, 
you, you sort of you don't need very like highly literary prose to kind of color up material that's already on its own very very powerful. Um, so that's sort of what I think of when I think of Polish reportage that it's it's written in quite a stripped back style. It has a very kind of polished storytelling form and it's focused on individual people on individual characters um some something i sometimes compare it to in the united states is this american life or kind of that tradition of like i think now it's kind of like podcast storytelling um but for whatever reason our our tradition of like long form written journalism um goes in a different direction, has sort of different stylistic characteristics. Yeah, I mean, you would, uh, the comparison that, you know, people sometimes make is to the new journalism of like, yeah. you know, Truman Capote, things like, you know, In Cold Blood, yeah. uh, journalism that's a little more sub uh, subjective than, yes. uh, than we imagine, uh, than what is our kind of American standard of journalism. But, and yeah. maybe that's kind of part of like, you know, you know, the issue of like, you know, how how to get you know i mean reportage is like the i think the most productive you know genre in poland um of the last say 10 15 years um and uh, you know it, but it's it's kind of a struggle to you know sell a you know sort of a, a different kind of journalism to an american publisher uh, where right. the standards for, um, you know, objectivity are different from, you know, supposed objectivity are different yeah. from, uh, from, uh, what we think of as, uh, as journalism. But, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I think you're very much right, you know, about the, the podcast. I was, I was thinking of bringing that up myself, in fact, and, and that, <laughs> um, and this American life studio 360 and, yeah. you know, and, uh, yeah, radio yeah. lab, all these kinds of, you know, new forms yeah. of, you know, of narrative, uh, that, yeah. that we Work. I mean, maybe that's what, you know, what reportage has to do, it, like has to like kind of make its way, like, you know, sort of, you, you know, you sort of, you have to do the podcast in English first to sell the book in English. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're right on the money with In Cold Blood. I think almost every Polish journalist I've talked to or reportage writer has told me that In Cold Blood is a major influence for them. Um, I know that American editors are sometimes skittish about um, Polish reportage blending fact and fiction, and I think this is partly a response to just the form that it takes, that it looks more like fiction than we're used to nonfiction looking. But I think it's also a response to the, the sort of the various controversies that broke out around Kapuscinski um, after the end of his life, after the publication of his biography, where it came out that there were certain things that he had made up, there were, you know, he had claimed to be in places that he hadn't been, and so on. Um, and what is true is that traditionally in Polish journalism, the responsibility for fact checking has lain with the journalist rather than with a separate fact checker. Um, this is That's changing. Important. Yeah, yeah. This is changing little by little because I think people have realized that it's not really a good way of doing things. Um, but, um, you and know, and yet we're losing our fact checkers here. And, you know, well, indeed. States. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, this is, you know, this is a point that I like to make is that American journalism has had more than its fair share of plagiarism scandals and people making things up scandals and real failures of, um, of journalistic fact checking. So I think it's, I don't think it's entirely fair um, to, uh, to, to be so hard on Polish journalism, on Polish reportage. There are differences though. There are, so for instance, there, um, it's much more acceptable in, in Polish journalism to sort of uh, interpret information about a person's internal or mental state while events are going on. You can speculate about what they might have been thinking about or what they might have been feeling in a way that in American journalism, you would have to have documentary evidence that that, that was going on. Um, or another example is that um, it's quite common in Polish reportage to paraphrase quotations or to rearrange them in a way that makes them kind of more dramatically successful in for your story. And I think the reason for this is because traditionally in Polish journalism, um, when you have finished the piece that you're writing, anyone who you've interviewed in the piece, you send the finished version to them to approve all of the quotations. Um, and this is something that not only you don't do in American journalism, but which is completely anathema. You're sort of supposed to be able to catch people off guard or saying something that they didn't really want to say. Um, right. But obviously, you know, when translating this can, this can pose certain challenges. I, um, 
I translated a, a, a profile of an author who writes in English um, by a very good uh, Polish reportage writer. And she sent me the transcripts of the interviews that she had done with this writer. And sure enough, the quotes were all kind of scattered in, in different places in a very different order than they'd originally been spoken. Um, so A, it was difficult for me to actually get the English into the English that this author had originally said, you know, the interview had been in English. Um, but then the journalist and I had to have a conversation about, you know, her intention was to submit this to American magazines. Um, and I said, well, you're going to have to tell them that this is what you've done because this is not, this is not sort of within the standard of American journalism. And she luckily, you know, uh, many reportage writers have a background in, you know, um, as uh, reporting on international affairs and, you know, know many international journalists, know many American journalists and are aware of the standards in our journalism and how we operate differently. So she was completely aware that this would be an issue and was very happy to kind of explain what she'd done and why. Um, but these are the kinds of cultural differences that you run into. You know, I'm not, I personally am not convinced that that produces like a lower quality journalism. I think it produces a different quality journalism that has kind of different markers. Mm -hmm. I think so too. That's uh, and it's, it's, you know, very, you know, it's a minefield. I mean, I, I, I've done some translation of things like that that were originally in English where I didn't have, mm -hmm. a, didn't have access to the oh, yes. uh, original uh, transcript and, and, you know, just felt like, like, well, I mean, like, like I, I once you know, did, I won't say who it is, but uh, translated an interview with a, a very important uh, North American writer. Uh, and I, you know, and I was supposed to do this from the Polish and I said, I, I can't like, make up their words i mean <laughs> this is like really a great writer and i'm sure they said it better than i can and you know what am i supposed to do and ultimately i did what i did the best i could but uh and uh, you know uh, maybe no one complained I, you know, as far as i can tell <laughs> um but it's it's but, it's yeah it's i mean very I, tricky it is and it's and when tra i feel like as when i'm translating nonfiction, i have less room to play around you know like um uh, an example that I give sometimes is um, when I'm translating nonfiction text that includes a lot, a lot of, say, slang or a lot of dialect or a lot of sort of like, you know, challenging spoken material in that respect. In with fiction, I feel very free to kind of just come up with to come up with a type of English that makes sense for this particular character. And then as long as all the information is there, whatever specific form it takes is not that important, you know, as long as it works stylistically. Whereas in with nonfiction, I feel a very strong responsibility not to put words in people's mouth. You know, right. I don't, I don't want them to be, to come across as saying something that they didn't actually say. And, um, so, you know, uh, I, I, I think about a book like Foucault in Warsaw by Remigiusz Szyzinski, which had a lot of sort of like mid 20th century, like queer Polish slang, which I yeah. didn't know, you know, <laughs> um, much less, you know, what that should look like in English. Um, but I really had to work very hard to preserve it as much as I possibly could in more or less the form that it was in Polish in a way that still worked in English. Let's look at this work by Nikola Grinberg uh, that you mm -hmm. uh, translated recently and which uh, was uh, shortlisted for the National Translation Award, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to say congratulations. Uh, I'd like to yeah. say sorry, but there's no one to say sorry to. Well, maybe we can start by talking a little about, you know, about the title, because in Polish, um, they use the title of a different story as the title for the uh, for the collection. That's right. Yeah. And the, the, the title in Polish is Reivach, which is a very interesting word. It's, um, it's a borrowing from Yiddish and actually ultimately from Hebrew. In Hebrew, it means, if I remember correctly, it, or the word in Hebrew it comes from means profit, as in, mm. as in the money that you make. I think it means something similar in Yiddish, but in the process of getting borrowed into Polish, it became associated, this is the explanation I've heard, it became associated with marketplaces and kind of the noise and hubbub of marketplaces. And so in Polish, it is a word that describes the sound of many voices speaking all at once, layered on top of one another. So sort of hubbub, cacophony, um, that kind of thing. Um, we, um, I went round and round in circles about how to, how to translate that title into English. Um, I asked, 
uh, friends of mine who are translators from Yiddish, if they had any advice, I looked for other Yiddish words that we use in English that I thought might uh, might possibly make sense. I tried to think of kind of creative ways of rendering it. And then in the end, it didn't matter anyway, because the publisher picked a different title. Yeah. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, um, the title that we went with, which I actually do really like, is um, it's the final line from, from one of the short stories. And um, uh, I think, and, and this is the reason the publisher picked it, sort of presents in some ways the central dilemma of, um, of the book, of some of the characters in the book. I did look, you know, a little research myself to try to figure out what, you know, what, what it could have been, you know, in, in Yiddish. I mean, there is a verb revenant, uh, oh. which is, uh, which is to roar or to howl. Oh, um, that's that, interesting. Uh, but the thing is, you know, that could be like, you know, um, you know, it could it it could it could be reflected back from Polish into Yiddish. I mean, that's you know, and then there are if you look up you know in older dictionaries, you know, revach um, uh, in Polish dictionaries, there you know the origin is uncertain. So uh, ah, and there, interesting. There, there are certain like you know German comparisons that yeah. uh, didn't make sense to me, but um, but you know, so it's it's it is a you know a kind of interesting. Uh, interesting problem as to how to how to translate that, and it's a, mm. and it's a good title for a collection of stories like this. You know is, that it's you know cacophony tumult. It's what the whole book is really. You yeah. know, every chapter is is a monologue by a different character, and they're they're monologues that sort of thematically overlap and contradict one another, and kind of the whole of them put together builds up this kind of joint like mosaic, like pointillistic almost picture of of basically modern Jewish life in Poland is how I understand. It. Yeah, and and in terms of genre, I mean, it's like these stories are like they're not long enough to be short stories. They don't have the plot complexity. I mean, maybe they have a twist, but the twist always seems to be kind of the same twist. It's like, oh, we didn't know we were Jewish, but then we found out that Gremo's Jewish, um, <laughs> which occurs in many many of the stories. But it's longer than it's longer than fl flash fiction. So it's something kind of. Yeah, they're like vignettes, maybe. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're inspired by um, real stories that that Mikowai was was told. It's sort of the the impetus for the book came out of responses, um, as I understand it, responses that readers had to his previous writing, which was which was nonfiction writing. He published three volumes of. Um, s sort of collections of interviews. I think of them as sort of oral history collections about yeah. basically the sort of subsequent generations of Polish Jews since the Holocaust. And um, and people responded to those books on a very you know profound emotional level, um, Jews and non-Jews, and felt compelled to come to Mikołaj and share stories with him. Um, these these stories are 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 fictional. Um, he said to me that he wanted to have more creative freedom in how he told them, um, and so allowed himself to kind of approach them as as fictional. But he's also told me that some of them are are based on real stories. Um, some of them I know are based on stories from his life or uh, lives of his friends. Um, there are others that he made up and that people are completely convinced are true and happened mm -hmm. to a friend of theirs. <laughs> um, okay. So it's interesting. I, you know, I think of it as a book that is that it is a book of fiction, but it the stories in it are true. You know, and yeah. it's a book about the truth. I think that that's a good uh, good description. Uh, would you uh, would you like to uh, to read a, read one of those vignettes? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, this is, this is my favorite, uh, story. I, I shouldn't say that I have a favorite story from the book, but this is my favorite story. Um, this is called an elegant purse. I used to keep leaving. Now I can't stop coming back. I thought everyone fought with their mother. So I didn't worry about it too much. We fought ferociously and in silence, mother and daughter. There were no explosions, just the sort of hiss of a lit fuse. Obviously a hiss leads to an explosion and it's something to be afraid of. How many times could it hiss without exploding? I figured mom could hiss without me, so I ran away to the edge of Europe. I'd finished my first year of studying something or other, which I wasn't enjoying anyway. Leaving was the christening of my adulthood. 
I was working, paying for a room, cultivating dreadlocks, and also a notebook full of resentments toward the entire world. A year later, I returned for the funeral of a distant cousin on my father's side. I didn't stick around long. I made it back to the edge of Europe before that familiar hiss had the chance to start up again. All in all, I could count that as a successful trip. In a new place, I started studying something much more interesting, and I traded my room for a student apartment. I grew my dreads out and kept writing to my mom. I could feel how important we were to one another, but putting it down on paper kept us safe from non-explosions. I went back for the second time a few years later, unexpectedly. Dad got sick. I dropped out of my last semester of college. While we were burying Dad, I asked if we could go visit Mom's family grave. I'd never been there, but I knew it existed because I'd heard her mention it to Dad. We didn't go. Mom was hissing again. I went back home. Now I had my own life, a boyfriend, a shared apartment, and a new citizenship. I stopped writing to Mom. We kept email and Skype on hand in case of anything unanticipated. I graduated, got married, had a daughter. I cut off my dreads and moved into my own apartment. I wrote to Mom that I was an adult and I wanted to be treated like one. Mom wrote back three weeks later saying she'd pay for me to come visit. I left my daughter with my husband and I went. We'd both missed each other a lot. I demanded we go together to Mom's family grave. Mom stopped talking to me. I didn't set eyes on the grave. I changed my ticket and went back to my family early. It took another few years for Mom to make up her mind to get in touch. I'd really been hoping she would, though in my heart of hearts, I didn't believe anything good would come of it. She wanted to see her granddaughter. I said, on one condition, you show me your family and I'll show you mine. She said she had another year until she retired and she couldn't do it until then. I didn't understand why the grave was dependent on her retirement. I flew over. I stayed with a friend. I asked mom to meet in a coffee shop. I treated it as our last chance. I was tough, cold, and standoffish. I thought I was in the right. Mom's eyes were swollen, her makeup was smudged a little, and she had an elegant purse, her good luck charm. She brought it whenever she was meeting someone important, and apparently it never failed her. We were sitting at a cafe table that held two cups of tea and a sugar bowl. Above them, I locked my eyes on Mom, and she couldn't withstand my gaze. I kept saying, contact with her granddaughter in exchange for the family grave. Tears ran down Mom's cheeks and finally messed up all her makeup. She begged me to wait a year. I didn't give an inch. A long silence fell. I had the feeling I was finally winning and Mom was giving in. She got up and went to the bathroom. She came back with her face washed and red. She put money for the tea on the table took me by the hand, and we left. She told me to hail a cab. She got in and said, the corner of Anielewicz and Okopova. The whole way, she didn't say a word, just cried. I didn't know where we were going. We held each other's hands, but I didn't let her hug me. We got out of the taxi, and in ten steps we found ourselves at the gate of the Jewish cemetery. Mom took a tissue out of her lucky purse, and wiped her face thoroughly. Again, she took me by the hand and looking every which way, grasped the handle on the metal gate. We passed a little building and turned right. Mom was walking faster than usual, though every now and again she lost her way. After a few minutes, we found ourselves standing at something like an obelisk with a lot of different names on it. I asked what we were doing there. Mom said this was the grave I wanted to see so badly. But mom, it doesn't have your maiden name on it. It's there, but it got changed when I was little. It expired. I was finally standing at my grandparents' grave. Before it dawned on me that my mother was Jewish, I heard her say that I was too. Mom, why did you want to wait until you retired to do this? Once you're retired, then you're safe, my girl. 
They won't throw you out of your job. They won't take away your benefits. There's no more risk. Did Dad know? He didn't ask. And whenever I started talking about it myself, he'd wait for me to finish and then never bring it up again. After getting back to my new country, I went to a rabbi to find out when my daughter's name day was. It turns out there's no such thing as a Jewish name day. I'm learning how to be a daughter all over again. My mom doesn't hiss anymore. That's a brilliant story. And yeah. it, you know, it, it rings true to a lot of, you know, kind of things that, you know, are part of, you know, I mean, now, like, you know, we say that there's like, you know, a, there's been this Jewish revival in Poland and, and, you know, it's very controversial. People have different views about it. They say, well, this is Jewish culture without Jews. Other people say, um, say that, well, there, there are more Jews there than you think. Um, and, uh, you know, if you stayed in touch with, you know, what was happening in Poland, maybe you'd realize that. And then there's like, you know, the complicated, you know, situation of, uh, you know, people like this character who, found out in adulthood that they were um, that they were Jewish, which is not not unusual. I mean, um, uh, it's, you know, when, you know, we go through like, you know, people trying to say what the number of, you know, Jewish people in Poland is. I mean, you hear anything from, oh, there are no more left. Uh, anyone who, you know, didn't leave after the Kielce pogrom or the uh, anti-Semitic campaign in 1968, you know, there are only a few. But yet, you know, I'm, I know some of those people and they're still there. They've been there the whole time. Um, and then, you know, and then there you could count the number of like maybe practicing Jews. You can count the number of you know, Orthodox Jews. And then you can count all the, you know, sort of people who aren't, you know, aren't too sure, um, you know, that maybe they were weren't raised Jewish, but then they discovered they were Jewish and they want to, you know, they want to, uh, to regain. And I, I think that that's a lot of what this, this kind of literature, these two books that we want to look at today are um, about, like figuring, you know, navigating that, uh, that whole, um, that whole cultural question um, about, um, uh, about uh, Jewish identity in, uh, in Poland today. I mean, I remember once, um, I was sitting with uh, at lunch with a, a, a couple of people who were, you know, of the the generation to have, you know, discovered in you know when they were teenagers or in their twenties, you know, when they were, uh, you know, that they were Jewish. You know, their parents told them or deathbed confession or whatever it was, and uh, and they asked me as an American, oh, when did you discover that you were Jewish? You know, as if that was a thing, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. like, I mean, and, and that's what I realized that this is a very different mode of consciousness than we have about, yes. you know, in the United States about, you know, Jewish identity. I said, well, I, I, if I discovered when I was Jewish, I think it was when I was eight days, eight days old, maybe. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't really remember that very well. Uh, yeah. So it, it was it, because it just and that was it was also surprising to them that, you know, that, yeah. you know, being Jewish wasn't necessarily marked, you know, in the way is it, that it is in Poland, and that's another kind of issue that comes up later in in this uh, in this uh, yeah. uh, collection. One, one of the things that Grinberg has written about in other contexts is that um, the moment when um, many Polish Jews realize that they are Jewish uh, is around the age of first communion, um, and he said this is this is how it was for him. He was born in 1966. His parents um, made the conscious decision to stay after 68, um, basically because his grandparents were too old to leave, uh, as I understand it, and they wanted to, they felt they needed to stay and look after them. Um, but, uh, you know, his family, they, I mean, they all actively identify as Jewish. They are not, as I understand it, um, particularly observant or religious at all. Um, but he said when when all of his other classmates in school started going off to classes to study for their first communion, and they all suddenly noticed that he was not going to those classes, like that was the moment when he was kind of like publicly identified as Jewish and, and when he became kind of like conscious of this difference for him. But it's very interesting reading his other writing, you know, um, uh, in I Accuse Auschwitz, which is one of his nonfiction books, um, he talks to um, Jews of his same generation in, in Poland, in the United States, and in Israel, all of whom have, have Polish-Jewish origins. Um, 
and a real marker of his Jewish upbringing in Poland personally is is isolation, right? Is of not knowing that many Jews of, of their, you know, they're not being Hebrew schools, you know, of their, you know, he didn't, he told me that he had a remote bar mitzvah that a relative in, in New Jersey did it for him because there was nowhere in Poland where he could, where they could make it happen. Whereas, you know, people of his same generation who were growing up in Brooklyn, were often in environments where everyone was the child of a Holocaust survivor. Everyone was Jewish. They, you know, so they sort of they they felt they felt kind of supported and felt able to talk about these stories in a way that in Poland was was much less possible. I think to to go back to your point about sort of numbers, a complicating factor in this um, to me is that I think it's still quite common for people. Uh, to not be open, you know, to sort of be in the closet about their Jewishness in Poland. Um, and I, you know, some of this is people who, you know, there's certainly a phenomenon of people who made the decision after the Holocaust that they were going to, to hide the fact that they were Jewish as a way of protecting themselves from, um, you know, from, from future trauma and, and danger. Um, but I think there's, there's still a sense among, among some people that it's not it's not 100% safe to be publicly Jewish in Poland sometimes. Um, and uh, so I think that there's a lot more caution about how one presents one, one's identity and how one talks about the past. Um, this is maybe something that we'll talk about more with Dołowy as well. There's a bit of a, a pact of silence around aspects of Jewish history in Poland um, that I think for Americans can be I'm not sure that it's hard to understand, but um, I think kind of, uh, you know, going through all of the layers of that and how it, how it sort of, how it has affected Polish society over a very long time is something that I'm certainly still learning about anyway. It comes out in the story Clementina, I, I thought, is mm. it's, you know, very, very vivid where she, you know, she says, you know, I had to tell someone that it's 2016 and I'm still hiding. Yeah. You know, that that's um, it's been well over 70 years now and I can't believe it myself. You know, and then yeah. later on, she says, um, many survived to tell their stories, but I survived not to not whisper a word for all these years. That that's yeah. um, that, that that's the, you know, the circumstance that uh, that they're in, that they feel that they still, you know, can't be you know, up, up front or, you know, in public about um, about being Jewish, uh, that, yeah. you know, that it's it's something that, you you know, you know, speak about in, you know, you know, understated tones or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, so, um, so how, how do you, you know, how do you see this playing out in uh, DeWolf? And maybe we should say what, what, uh, what DeWolf's work is about. It's not translated yet. Uh, Patricia no. DeWolf's Skarbe uh, means treasures. Um, and she, you know, explores what the meaning of that, uh, that word could be uh, in various senses, you know, uh, and, and it's about very, very much the, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the, the mythology of treasures um, as they pertain to, uh, to um, what is in Poland today called post-Jewish property. Yes. Um, and she, you know, sort of inflects that by calling them, you know, post-Jewish treasures at a, at a certain point. For me, what's interesting about this book is that I, I, I feel like I have read a certain amount about, um, you know, Americans who are learning about their Polish Jewish heritage and who are going to Poland in search of, you know, traces of their ancestors, or in some cases in search of, you know, property or, or you know, material, um, material remains, you know, objects, letters, photographs, things like this. Um, and I feel like I've read a certain amount about Poles, particularly non-Jewish Poles, who are involved in conserving um, and supporting uh, Jewish culture, both in the present and, you know, and, and historically, you know, maintaining Jewish cemeteries, maintaining old synagogues that are no longer being actively used, and, and so on and so on. What, what's so interesting to me with Dolova's book is that I've always felt like these two groups of people were sort of talking past one another a little bit, and Dolova very literally brings them together in the book. Um, you know, she, um, I, I got to meet her in Warsaw this summer, actually, which was really interesting. Oh yeah, what and, was the occasion for that? 
Uh, do you know we had we had a friend in common? We had a mutual oh. friend, um, uh, someone who used to work at the institute actually, who introduced us. Um, but uh, she the um, Polish Cultural Institute at the Polish Cultural Institute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but she knows Mikołaj Grinberg as well. She is now the um, the president of the the JCC in Warsaw. Um, so now we have lots of friends in common. But anyway, um, uh. You know, what I was going to say is that she, um, so she speaks English. She was actually um, born, I think, in the United States, although didn't live there for very long, but has um, uh, has very strong American connections. And um, so she is able to act as kind of like a bridge between these two groups. This is uh, the kind of thing that I think would be perfect for radio. I mean, that uh, that it, it makes like and maybe maybe because of her like familiarity with American culture, she's you know, she's probably influenced by that to some degree. I mean, this mm. uh, if you could like, you know, have some sort of radio, you know, radio broadcast where you had these overlapping and, you know, interwoven stories, you know, yeah. from both sides about um, about this. Uh, um, so-called post-Jewish property. Um, and, you know, in one case we get, you know, we get, uh, you know, uh, an American who sends this uh, excessively polite letter um, asking about, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I would, you know, kindly request, you know, to find out about the disposition of the, uh, the property that my you know, grand- great grandparents owned, at, you know, the, down the street, there was the house that my cousin owned. And, and he's, he's obviously gone to great lengths to you know, craft this letter with an attorney and got, and, you know, probably paid a lot of money to have it translated into Polish. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, gets no response. And yeah. so which yeah. we can we can kind of imagine. And, you know, so that's one side of it. And that's, you know, you know, something that a lot of, you know, polls express, you know, concern about a fear about is like, you know, oh, well, I've been living in this house. I, uh, you know, I wasn't alive during the war and I, I just bought this property. What if it's, you know, not really, you know, like, what if I really don't have title to it or something like that? And, yeah. you know, and then, you know, and then on the other side, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have people who, you know, who have objects that, you know, that they've, you know, somehow inherited, you know, and that, um, that maybe, you know, were, you know, stolen from you know from graves from houses left behind you know the one the or one symbolic knows. thing was the the sugar bowl was was one that you know and the uh, the jewish neighbors said here why don't you could you just take care of my you know china while while we're away and then uh, you know this is you know feel free to use it do whatever you want it and then it kind of kind of transpires that well you know we're, we're probably not coming back and maybe this is your dowry there caretakers of this uh you know treasure which could also be a curse i mean that yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they didn't intend to own it but they they do own it and then you know they're they're probably some who you know who just want to keep their property the thing that really that i thought was so amazing about this book that i think i hadn't really thought about before was that you know she talks to people who live in um in towns uh all in all different places in poland and um you know there's one character, I don't remember his name, but he, he talks about how his town was a shtetl before the war, that it was, you know, probably 70 or 80 percent Jewish, and how there are no Jews who live in it anymore, that everyone was killed during the Holocaust. And the population that lives there now, I'm sure, you know, are, are also the descendants of, of people who were displaced during the war and probably come from all over Poland. Um, and yet, he talks about how there is essentially no public trace of the town's Jewish history. You know, there are not monuments, there are not plaques, there is not anything. And so you would never know that that was the town's history unless you kind of specifically went looking for it. And this is something I've thought about in other contexts of Polish history as well, how, you know, under communism, when the, 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 the historical narratives were so tightly managed by the government, history, real history, had a way of moving from the public sphere into the private sphere. I always think of the kitchen table, like everyone in Poland knew what happened at Katyn. They weren't allowed to talk about it in public, but they all talked about it at their kitchen tables. Everybody knew. And I feel like it's there are elements of, of that with Jewish history as well. Everyone knows this history. These histories have been passed down through families. There are people still alive who remember some of it. Um, there's a, a really interesting book called um, Jazgo, which is like shard or splinter by a guy called 
I think he's called Miroslav Pritchie. Who writes about, basically the book is him going to these villages out in the Polish countryside, walking into the shop and saying, can you tell me where the oldest person in the village lives, please? And then he goes to speak to this person and ask them about what happened to the Jews in that village during the war. And this old woman or old man will sort of go, oh, well, you know, it's a story that I don't like to tell people, but I suppose everyone who was involved is long dead now, so I might as well tell you. And then she says, you know, there was this family who lives here and who was Jewish and this other family here who was Polish and they, they murdered, they raped, they pillaged, they whatever, and their bodies are buried in that field over there, you know, and the, there, or there are other remains in so-and-so's field and they know where all of these places are. But this is something that is never spoken about in public. You know, he, in these same chapters, he goes and, and will talk to kind of local officials, school teachers, historians. Nobody will talk to him. Everyone is sort of in denial that these things happened. But this is, this is the dynamic that Scarborough reminded me of, is that this memory is there. It's, 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 but it's confined to private spaces. It's confined to private conversations. It's kept off the record. Um, and that, that has the effect over a long period of time of, of, on the one hand, sort of of erasure, but also it's, it, it, it has a way of kind of seeping into kind of every aspect of, of, of memory and, and of life in the country in a way that's very difficult to articulate. Um, but uh, that I feel like is a real, uh, a real characteristic of this type of story in Poland. Does any of that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's, I mean, that's, that's probably why it lends itself so well to uh, this kind of genre, the genre yeah. of like this sort of subjective, you know, podcast, mm. you know, style radio is that, uh, is that it has to come from subjective stories and the real yeah. treasures that she's uncovering are, you know, are the memory. I mean, one character says, you know, sort of toward the end that, that, um, uh, that, uh, you know, you know, I don't want, um, just paraphrase, paraphrasing here. I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want the, you know, the government to, you know, tell the history of, you know, of, uh, of our Jewish ancestors, right. Uh, that, uh, this is our story, right. So we should be, you know, telling the story. So, um, you know, there are, we don't want it to be co-opted for some political narrative yeah. or something like yeah. that. And, um, well, this is like one kind of way of trying to get at it, to try to yeah. get at you know, the subjectivity of memory, which is, um, you know, the memory of, you know, of culture that was lost and not just, you know, the culture, you know, for the Jews, but the culture of, you know, Polish culture with Jews in it, you know, that that was a huge part of uh, of what culture was before the war. I mean, that um, that that's that, you know, and that it, you know, it would suddenly uh, disappear, or go into hiding or people wouldn't talk about it or only would be at the kitchen table, like you say. Um you know that uh, you know to you know go back to um, uh, to Grinberg. I mean, there's you know, there's something you know about the specificity of you know Polish Jewishness that uh, there's there's this one character in the story called um, called Chess. I think it was yeah. or no, uh, yeah, it, yeah, that's that's the story. Uh, and he says the you know the beginning. He says I'm a secret Jew, uh, and it, you know, and he. Uh, he, you know, he talks about, and it's very strange. I mean, this, he has this very bizarre behavior. He, he goes to Israel on Christian pilgrimages because that's a way to go from Poland to Israel. Um, so and then visit his relatives there. Yeah. Without yeah, anybody vi- knowing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, you know, so he goes on the pilgrimage and, you know, and they go to Nazareth or whatever, and then in Bethlehem and then they, you know, and then he comes back with the, with the pilgrimage group. So he can always say he's part of the pilgrimage group, but really he was just playing hooky and visiting his visiting his family and then like the you know the way he describes it at the end which i i think is really powerful is i'm a pole with a jew living inside him and a jew who doesn't exist without that pole now and then i play chess with myself and you know who wins sometimes one sometimes the other um and that's it's another one of my favorite stories in that book yeah 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 and as you say it's it 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 really I think we have a habit of talking about Polish and and Jewish history and Polish and Jewish culture as being these sort of separate and slightly opposed things. But I feel like for for as long as I have been learning kind of specifically about Polish Jewish culture and as I've been, you know, I'm I'm not from a Jewish background. And so as I've been learning more about about Jewish culture in general, 
um, the more that I have been finding the two are very, very tightly intertwined with one another. Um, and uh, I think that there's, um, and, and I think this goes some way to explaining, you know, we were talking about how many Jews are there in Poland nowadays. Mikołaj Grinberg um, says that the, the number of Jews in Poland amounts to a rounding error, you know, proportionally speaking, it's really a very tiny number of people. But the, the cultural weight, you know, the weight of Jewish culture in Poland, the importance of Jewish culture in Poland is far in, in excess of the actual number of Jews who are in Poland today. And I think that goes some way towards explaining it, that I think Polish culture in some ways doesn't make sense without Jewish culture. You know, it's that and it's that, um, you know, it's all these people who, you know, find out later in life that they were Jewish. That I, I think in some sense, this the interest in Jewish culture is in part um, the desire of those people to, you know, to to reconnect, to figure out, you know, what it is that they've lost, um, that, um, you know, it's not that they're, you know, that it's not strictly the case that, you know, that, you know, this is Jewish culture without Jews. This is Jewish culture with Jews who didn't grow up with Jewish culture in some sense uh, yeah. that um, that and are trying to you know just sort of figure out where it is uh, for them. And I, I know, um, you know, some American Jews respond to, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, the the cultural revival is like, you know, is as, you know, Jewish Disneyland or something like that. But uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I've you know, felt that myself, I, I think at the beginning of it, you know, going into a, you know, a Jewish restaurant, a Jewish restaurant and, you know, and, and seeing food that my grandmother wouldn't recognize. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, maybe that was because she was, you know, not Polish Jewish, but from, you know, from Romania. Uh, but uh, both of my grandmothers um, uh, were of uh, Romanian Jewish background. I think there are some people who see it as, as cultural whitewashing, you know, as a way yeah. of, of kind of glossing over parts of Poland's history that it doesn't want to talk about. But I, I think it's much more complex than that. I, I feel like the the thing I keep coming back to um, when I think about Jewish culture in, in Poland or Jewish history in Poland is that it's all of these things at once. It's, yeah. it's so deep and it's so complex and it's so it's so contradictory and people have such deep feelings about it, Jews and Poles and, and Americans and Israelis and everybody else as well, which makes things difficult too. I feel like so many of these developments happen in Poland with a feeling that the rest of the world is kind of peeking over their shoulder and having something to say about what's going on in Poland um, in a way that on the one hand is natural, but on the other hand, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, I, I don't want to say it stops it from kind of developing naturally in the way that it would in Poland, because, I, you know, so much of this happens thanks to support from abroad and thanks to, you know, Jews in America or Jews in Israel who want to support um, Jewish cultural activity in Poland. But it changes the dynamic, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, have you heard anything from uh, Patricia about whether this book is uh, uh, coming out in English at any point or anyone working on it, do you know? Not to my knowledge. We did have sort of a conversation about, you know, what might be involved in bringing it over into into English. And I know that it's something that she's interested in. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, no, no steps have been taken, taken yet. I'll put it out there. There are, you know, editors who watch this program um, <laughs> that uh, this is a very interesting book to, you know, to be translated, uh, very interesting formally um, and, uh, and in its content. The form is actually, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because apart from the very interesting subject matter, um, she's done uh, a very classic Polish storytelling technique, which is that she's taken a whole bunch of different stories and kind of broken them up into fragments and interwoven them with one another in a way that is um, uh, that's very interesting and very fun to read. Um, I think she's done a really good job with it. It sets up uh, resonances between yeah. these different uh, these different streams that uh, yeah. that you couldn't have otherwise. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so let me ask you, uh, what are you working on next? I am continuing to do some work with Mikołaj Grinberg. Uh, I'm happy to say uh, I've just Very finished good. a long sample from his new book, which is about the refugee crisis uh, on the Polish-Belarusian border, um, and uh, I am doing some work on uh, his book, Confidential, 
Poufna in Polish, which is a, and people in Poland call it a short story collection. I think it's a novel um, that's uh, based on uh, his own family story um, and is uh, just as kind of short and, and poignant and, uh, and stripped back and very emotionally deep as, uh, as I'd like to say sorry. Um, I think it's a really wonderful book, so I'm excited to be doing more on that. That sounds great. And also, let me ask you, I know you were you had a, a great residency at Princeton for a while. Um, mm-hmm. Are you doing any uh, teaching, mentoring or anything like that? I'm actually mentoring for the National Center for Writing in the UK. I have a, a Polish mentee for the next six months, and I am mentoring for the Yiddish Book Center in, uh, in Western Massachusetts. Uh, I'm working with uh, a young Yiddish translator who's uh, translating an autobiographical novel by one of his ancestors uh, who was from Warsaw. Um, and uh, so it's, I've, I've done this with the Yiddish Book Center for a few years now, working with mentees who are working on Polish material that's in Yiddish. I don't know Yiddish, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's really fun and it's really interesting work. And it kind of brings me to a whole you know, other aspect of, uh, of this topic that, uh, that I love learning more about. Wonderful. Well, you know, it's increasingly becoming important for people in Polish studies to learn Yiddish. I mean, I, 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 I've, you know, started learning Yiddish some years ago, uh, because I felt like, well, you know, this is what I need. Ariko Kato, a great Japanese scholar and translator of Polish literature started learning Yiddish in Japan, where she, you know, she, I asked her, do you have anybody to speak Yiddish with in Japan? She said, oh, no, no, but, uh, <laughs> but she can read Yiddish. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming a, a you know, absolutely a, an important part of the field. So absolutely. thank you so much uh, for, uh, for joining us on the program. It's My absolute pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was great talking to you. All right. Well, we'll we'll try to try to do it again in the not too distant future. I hope so. Remember to subscribe and lift us up past 1000 subscribers. Watch the credits for some recommendations about how you can support aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. I'd like to thank the Polish Cultural Institute New York, which sponsors our program. Bartek Remisko, Head of Humanities and Literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, is our executive producer. Natalia Yudin is my fellow producer and editor. Our opening and closing music is by Radek Przedpelski. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. We're struggling with some scheduling issues at the moment, so we're not exactly sure who our next guest will be, but some of the topics we're working on are Ukrainian writer Oksana Zabushko, Polish painter, writer, and soldier Józef Czapski, Alexandra Kramer's new book on the sound of contemporary Polish poetry, and the Ukrainian school in Polish romantic poetry. See you next month. Tak szare, tak płaskie są domy ludzi pojazdy.